this is Carla, and you are listening to The Right Be Cupcakes. Uh, this is going to be a little raw because I am on location for the first time, so bear with me. Alright, <clears throat> here we go. Virginia is full of woods. Don't believe the Blair Witch Project. It is possible to get lost in America these days, at least in Virginia. In these isolated woods between the Virginian towns of Clifton and Fairfax Station, this was used to great advantage, and an asylum for the insane has been quietly housed there for some time. For the insane, and yes, perhaps also for just the dangerous and the unwanted as well. Sometime in the mid-20th century, this asylum for the insane was shut down. Some say for overcrowding, some say mismanagement, some say abuse of the patients. So the powers that be loaded up the patients into buses bound for nearby Lorton Prison, the only facility in that area of Virginia possibly equipped to handle their and the community's needs. During this macabre commute, one of the poorly maintained state buses threw a rod, perhaps. No one's quite certain what happened, or will admit what happened, but one of the buses crashed. Maybe the other bus drivers and guards didn't see, or maybe they did see and were afraid to stop. Many of the inmates, excuse me, patients, on the wrecked bus tried to take advantage of the situation and escape in the chaos, but all were caught, except two, Douglas Griffin and Marcus Walster. For months, authorities quietly, secretly, searched these forests that I'm in for these dangerous, disturbed men, but the only sign of human habitation in these isolated woods were several, several cleanly skinned and gutted bunnies strung up in the trees and from the old disused railway underpass known then as the Fairfax Station Bridge. The authorities, you see, did not notify the public of the fugitives or of this grisly evidence of their presence for fear of inciting panic. They didn't even tell the public when Marcus Walster was found, dressed and gutted like one of those bunnies hanging from this very bridge. They figured the location was remote, so they had the situation under control. But unbeknownst to cops, local teens used this Fairfax Station's bridge as a private hangout. That Halloween night, teens who had no idea about any of this gathered at the bridge to drink and to make out. And the next morning, horrified local parents and shame-faced authorities found those teens hanging from this very bridge, cleaned and gutted just like those bunnies and just like Marcus. No sign of Douglas Griffin has ever been found. But the story of the Bunny Man Bridge does not end there. Not only do local teenagers warn that if you spend the night at the bridge, you will hear screams. They warn that no one spending the night at Halloween at the bridge ever returns to tell the tale. Anyone who dares to reenact that awful night will end their days hanging from the bridge like Marcus and like Douglas Griffin's bunnies. But believe it or not, the story of the Bunny Man Bridge gets worse. Twice in October 1970, the esteemed Washington Post reported attacks and threats on locals near the area of the Bunnyman Bridge by a man wearing a bunny suit and brandishing a hatchet or an axe. On October 18, 1970, Robert Bennett and his fiancée were sitting in their car near the general area of the bridge when a man wearing a bunny suit screamed at them about trespassing in his area. Then he threw a hatchet through the windshield of their car. Forty-five years later, they were still so shaken they didn't like to discuss the incident. But when approached by the Washington Post, the woman's aunt verified that she vividly remembered the awful experience of combing glass particles out of the woman's hair. On October 29, 1970, Paul Phillips saw a man in a bunny suit standing on the porch of an unoccupied house near the, near the Bunnyman Bridge. When this man saw Phillips watching him, he began chopping at one of the porch joists with an axe and shouting about other people trespassing on his land. Douglas Griffin or not, 
some man has taken on the legend as his own and believes himself to be the bunny man. Apparently, all it takes to tempt him out of hiding is being near the bridge on an October night. I was able to get the GPS coordinates and directions to the bridge from Atlas Obscura, and I'm going to stay out here, announcing my presence by listening to podcasts without headphones. Um, I have some realistic rabbit game strung up in the trees near the bridge, a couple dangling from the bridge. If it's the same man, if, say, he was in his 20s in 1970, he'd be my dad's age. That's perfectly reasonable. If it's not him, then it might be an inheritor to the myth, much like I think the 1970 Bunny Man probably self-inherited the legend of Douglas Griffin. Once I draw him out, I'll capture him on film, and I'll share what happens next on my next episode. I'm going to stop recording this intro now, and I'm going to upload it to Tyler of the Minds of Madness podcast, who's agreed to publish it for me while I'm out in the woods. Thank you, Tyler. This is Carla for That Right Be Cupcakes, and I will see you guys next week with hopefully the coolest legend tripping report ever. Happy early Halloween. <laughs>